So this morning as we begin, um, we're going to look in the scripture at a very uh, symbolic passage of scripture today. And so I wanted to start with a couple of symbols so we can kind of get in, in the practice of looking at symbols. There's a symbol here on the screens here in the auditorium. And what does this tell us? Handicap. This means don't park here unless you've got one of those decals or unless you want to get a ticket or maybe I should say deserve a ticket, right? And this is for people who, who are, you know, who are either disabled or are maybe a stick man sitting on top of the letter C, right? But we know what this means. It, it's a symbol. It has a meaning. What, let's see this one. Hospital. If you see one of these next to the road, if you follow these signs, you will eventually make it to a hospital. All right, how about this one? Oh. Now see, this one is a special one. In fact, if you're watching this you know, on the video, you should watch next, last week's message before coming back to this one. Because here at North Orange this week, uh, the Oreo came to symbolize what? Temptation. Yeah, it came to symbolize temptation. And I've got to tell you, I loved hearing the stories of your Oreos this week. Um, I, I love that some of you kept them in a Ziploc bag all week until you said, all right, it's been a week, I'm going to eat it today. Um, I especially loved that uh, as a couple of people were leaving, I overheard them say, you know, he said, I can't eat my Oreo. He didn't say, I couldn't eat your Oreo. Satan isn't the only one who's crafty. Um, and, then, and then Brother Brad, he, Pastor Brad, as he was leaving, he said, give me two, one to eat and one to be tempted by. And so I, I thought that was really good. What I, what I love and what I really can't wait for is the day, you know, maybe weeks, months, years from now, when some of us parents have kids, you know, leaving for prom, and we'll look at our kids and say, hey, remember, don't eat any Oreos tonight, right? Like, because that temptation can come in a number of forms. So there you go. This is a symbol for us, temptation. How about this one? Money. Yeah, that's pretty universal. A pretty universal sign for money. Let's do one more. Ah, uh, an engagement ring, right? And that, that's a symbol. And it's a symbol of something that is, is real, right? It's something that, that actually happens in our lives, most of our lives. It's something that, you know, we, you know, we wear these things around. If I take this ring off, I'm still married, but I put it back on. It it's connects me to an event that happened in history. I especially love how an engagement ring without any words at all tells a story. Like in the past couple of months, I've seen a couple of young ladies walk up to people and not say anything and cause those people to scream and cry and hug them. <laughs> right? A lady, young lady walks up and she says, Ah! So excited. And, you know, and, th and there's hugs and there's, because we, we know the story. He asked you to marry him. He asked you to spend the rest of his life with him. That's so wonderful. And all of us guys, all we keep thinking about is, that one right there. And we think how much he already spent, how much more they're going to spend on a wedding. Elope. Anyway, um, that's a freebie. You don't have to elope. Um, but these symbols, they communicate things to us. And here's, here's why I love, I love symbols and why I love the story we're going to look at today so much. Because the story we're going to look at today is, is a story that is historical. It, it actually happened, but it is also symbolic. It also stands, it also represents something, a way that God communicated to his people through the life of the prophet. Here's the thing about God. Sometimes he communicated through prophets in this way, that he said, go and declare to the people this. And they would go and they would say to the people this. They say to the people a thing. But sometimes he would tell the prophets not just to say something, but to live something. If you remember the story of Ezekiel, that Ezekiel spent over a year laying on his side, cooking his food over a pile of feces as a way of to symbolically tell the children of Israel, you don't want war, but war is coming and it's going to be awful, 
Right? He's, he used Amos using a plumb line to say that, that this, is, this is justice. This is what it's supposed to look like. So God often uses symbolism in the life of the prophet. But I think the symbol that we see today, that we're going to look at today, in the life of Hosea is my favorite prophetic symbolism um, in, in the scripture. Uh, this, we're, today we're going to look at the story of Hosea. Now let me give just a brief bit of history or background on Hosea. Hosea is sometimes referred to as Israel's deathbed prophet because he was the last person to prophesy in Israel before the nation of Israel was destroyed by Assyria. So he is preaching this message into a, a group of people who are on the, on the cusp of destruction, but they don't know it, right? They should know it because that is certainly the message Hosea gives to them, but they don't, they don't comprehend it. They can't understand it because as they look around, as the wealthy, as the powerful of Hosea's time look around, they love what they see because they're getting more powerful, they're getting wealthier, when they look at their lives, they think, this is good. But there was horrible poverty in Israel. There was horrible injustice in Israel. In fact, there were, the situation there was so bad, there was just debauchery everywhere, even to the point that there were priests in the time of Hosea that would, would misconstrue scripture, that would teach things to make themselves wealthy. Even to the point that there were priests who would commit murder. This was the age in which Hosea was giving this message to God's people. Now, sometimes when I am in a sermon, when I'm listening to a sermon, I do what I know some of you do, and that is that I'll read the passage that the preacher's preaching about, and then I'll just kind of keep reading, and I'll keep reading. Let me just warn you a little bit. If you decide to just keep reading in the book of Hosea, it gets dark. It gets dark. It gets dark. I'll just, I'll say it gets kind of a little bit ugly because in this, when Hosea is declaring this message to God's people, God isn't just upset, he's furious. In fact, I would say not just furious, but the way I like to, I like to describe God's anger being poured out in this time period. Have you ever seen the movie, The Christmas Story? Yeah, good. You know the scene, you know the scene where she's watering the plant and accidentally breaks the lamp. Yeah, the major award, yeah. She accidentally breaks the lamp and he goes and he gathers up the pieces and she says, it was an ugly lamp. And he, he's so hurt that he, he literally, he can't even put words together and he just walks out and he looks at her and he says, not a finger. God is not a finger angry here. Like he, he is as angry as God ever shows himself to be. And his, his wrath that he pours out is, is horrible. It is awful. But he's gracious in, in giving them warning and telling them, here's your opportunity. Here's your chance to repent. Here's your chance to turn from your wickedness. Here's how he communicates this lesson to them symbolically. You know, Hosea chapter one, I'll, be start, I'll start in verse two. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he tells Hosea to go and find a woman who will be his wife, who has been a prostitute. All right, some of us found out things about our spouse after we were married. That's not the case here. Hosea knows the sort of person that he's dealing with going in. He specifically goes and finds her. And not only does he go and find her, but let me say this. Part of the symbolism in this story is it comes through the names of the people. Hosea means the one who saves. His wife's name means perfection, which you'd think, perfection, that's a great name. That's a great name for, for a wife. The, the word here for perfection is Gomer, which is not a name that has really stood the test of time, has it? Uh, you, you don't see you know, Gomer quilted on a lot of pink baby blankets nowadays, but it, meant, it means perfection. And so he goes in verse three, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name 
Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, if you don't have a lot of background in this, let me just tell you that, that Jezreel was, was a name that was sort of infamous. It was the site of, of a horrible slaughter where 70 young men were, were be killed and beheaded. Horrible, horrible location. It would be, I would think, sort of the modern equivalent would be like naming your kid Columbine or Sandy Hook. It, it carried with it an automatic connotation of, of butchery, of wickedness. It, just, it was just awful. So to name his son Jezreel was to say, look, this is the destruction that is coming for you. He goes on. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. In verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name Lo Ruhana, or no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. He says, not only is the first child named after this location of horrible slaughter, the second, the daughter is named no mercy because that is what he's promising to Israel, that there will come a time they will cry out for mercy and they will not receive it. And the last child, verse 8, when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name Lo-Ami, not my people for you are not my people, and I am not your God. It is a constant refrain through the Old Testament. The promise is, you will be my people, I will be your God. I, I am your God, you are my people. And here he's saying, you won't be. Time's coming. You're not going to be. These are maybe the three worst names that you could give to children. As the father of one named Baylor, I find some comfort in that. I can always say, hey, at least I didn't name you Jezreel. <laughs> but these are the names, and each of these things communicate to the people how dedicated God was and how dedicated the prophet was to putting out a message of impending judgment. A bad time was coming for Israel, but more than that, a bad time is coming Really, for Hosea. Bad time's coming for Hosea. Now, I need to say this because, because we're talking about symbols. I want you to understand that although this is symbolic, this is what actually happened. There's nothing in the language here that makes us think that this is a story that Hosea just made up. No, this, is, this was Hosea's life. Hosea married a woman who had been a prostitute, and they had three children, and they gave them these awful, no good names. And they lived together, and they, they loved each other. They loved each other, and sometimes in our culture we think that first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby carriage, right? That's sort of how we've been conditioned to think that first comes love, then comes marriage, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw this out there, and you can disagree with me if you want, but I'm gonna say that, that before real love comes, that I think sometimes marriage comes before real love. Because I think as in love as you are when you're wearing the engagement ring but you haven't gotten married, when you're 10 years in, when you're 20 years in, I think then you really start to see what love really is. I think then you really start to understand it. I think that, that the love that happens between a husband and a wife, it just, it gets better, it gets stronger, it should get sweeter as the days go by. And so even though I don't think Hosea and Gomer were in love when they got married, they, they fell in love. They lived life together. She had morning sickness and he was there holding the, I don't know, the wicker basket or something, right? And, and, and they were together for the middle of the night feedings. And they, and they were together when Lo and me got sick and they thought they were gonna lose him. And they prayed and he was saved. They, they were together. She stood by his side when his dad died. And she held him as he, as he cried. They were together. They, they loved 
each other, which makes what happens next so heartbreaking that he, she was his. She was his mate, she was his partner in life. She was his, and for some reason, she leaves. Now, we don't, we don't really understand why. We don't know the reason why. I would say that, that when a parent, when a spouse just leaves, that I'm, I'm gonna say that we don't ever really know the entire reason why. And so Hosea doesn't know. Hosea doesn't understand exactly why she has left, but, but she leaves. And you can imagine. Some of, some of you don't have to imagine very hard. Some of you can just remember what that pain is like to be abandoned. And we can imagine that Hosea must have been bitter. He must have been very angry. His children must, could not have understood why mom is gone, but she is. Why that sacred bond between them would be broken like that, they, they can't understand it. There had to have been a lot of anger and a lot of bitterness. There may have been a point when, when Hosea would have wanted to have found her just to have put a finger in her face and say, you have hurt me, and I want to hurt you. If you read Hosea chapter 2, you see that God uses that. God uses that part of Hosea's story. And he, he looks at Israel, and he says, just like Gomer has been an unfaithful spouse, you have been an unfaithful people. You have not been faithful to me. And God declares what, what his judgment to them will, on them will be. He says that this is what's coming to you, and you will, he says, you will deserve what you're getting. And it's dark. And then there's chapter three. And in Hosea chapter three, things change course a little bit. Hosea chapter three, verse one says, the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. And so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Essentially 30 shekels of silver is what that is worth. Today, modern, that'd be about four months wages for a day laborer, maybe 12, $15,000 not the silver value, but what it was worth as far as buying power at that time. So he, he spends about four months' wages to buy his wife back. And I, I sometimes wonder what that scene was like, that he goes and he searches for this wife, that he goes to find this, this faithless wife, and there he finds her on an auction block. And whereas there had to have been something inside him that wanted to to yell at her, you were mine. You were mine, you were my partner, we belong together. I, I would have done anything for you. I would have done everything for you. And he probably would have wanted to say, you deserve what is happening to you right now. But instead of saying, you were mine and now you're not, he says, you are mine and I will pay the price for you. And God uses this to say that, all, yes, judgment's coming for Israel, but there's still hope. That there's still hope for God's people because the destruction that's coming isn't complete. They're not going to be utterly destroyed. They're not going to be completely obliterated. There is still hope that is coming. He uses this marriage and the redemption to talk about what it's like to be the God of a people who are not faithful, and yet God is faithful. That even though the people belonged to him, that he formed them as a people, even though by every way of describing it, they belonged to him, he would pay the price for them. And he would pay the price for them with what has become a symbol in our culture, the cross. But the cross isn't just a symbol, of course. It's the historical reality of what actually happened. Romans, in Romans chapter five, Paul describes it this way. He says that, uh, that there are times when someone would die for a good person, but that Christ Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. That while we were enemies of God, he died for us. That God knew us. 
That God knew us as much as a husband of some years knows his wife, that God knew us. He knew every story, he knew all of the history. He was there through all of the sicknesses, through all of the trials and tragedies of life. He was there through all of it. We belonged to him, and yet we were faithless, but he was not. He was faithful, and when it came time, at just the right, perfect time, when all of humanity was on the auction block, God stepped forward And at the cost of his own son, he paid the price for us. Hallelujah. This is what he has done for us. This is more than just a symbol for us. It's a reality for us. That there was a time when we were faithless There was a time for those of us who were believers when we were on the block and Jesus said, I'll pay the price for you. This morning, my call, the first part of my call is this. Today, your life may be on that block. Today, you might be facing trials. You may feel like you are being sold into slavery because of maybe temptation Maybe your own bad decision making. Maybe you have <laughs> look at your life and you know I've been faithless and I deserve what I'm going through. But the grace of Christ Jesus can deliver you. He wants to deliver you. So this morning we're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to have a time of invitation where if you've never accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I hope you will today. The invitation is not just, though, to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but it's also this. It's also to receive his forgiveness. Receive his forgiveness in salvation for a first time. But that's not the only time that we need his forgiveness, is it? No. You may look at your life. You may have, in the past week, done a lot worse than eating an Oreo. You may look back at years and months, and you may just need his forgiveness, that you need to know that he forgives. Well, the second part of the invitation is that, that if you're at a place that you need his forgiveness, I, I hope that you will take this time, take these few minutes to ask the Lord to forgive you. Stand with me as we, as we go to the Lord. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you that while we were faithless, that you were faithful. Lord, we are so glad that when humanity was on that auction block, that you said that you'd pay the price. When you had every right to put your your finger in our faces and say, you have hurt us. You have hurt me. You have been unfaithful. You said, I'll pay the price for you. Lord, my prayer is that if there is any here today who knows you as Lord and Savior, but but they need fresh forgiveness, I pray that they will find that forgiveness here today. Lord, if there's any here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, who has never experienced what it is to be yours, I pray that today could be the day of their salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. 
eyes, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. Before we take up the offering this morning, before we take up the offering, my honor, Aaron, before we take up the offering, I, I, I want to extend this invitation just a little bit longer. You guys can go ahead and file out right there. The thing is, is that that symbol, that cross, that engagement, the symbol of what God has done for us, it doesn't just extend, does not just extend to what has been done for us. Hosea's example, Hosea's example in, in forgiving a faithless wife, God's example in forgiving a faithless people, it isn't just good news for us. It should be good news for everyone in our lives. Because some of you here are not just Gomer, some of you here are Hosea. Some of you here have every right to put your finger in someone's face and say, you hurt me. You and, you and I, we were partners. We were friends. We, we were family. We, we were in the same Sunday school class, man. We, we were on, on, on all these committees together. We, we were partners. And you hurt me. I know what you did. Some of us, some of us are in the role of, of Gomer today. Some of us are in the role of Hosea. But here's what all of us need. See, the reason why Gomer left, we don't know the exact reason, whether she was faithless, whether she was prostituting herself out. We don't know that. What we do know is this, is that there was something wrong with her heart. There was something deeply broken in her heart. And the reason I know that is because there's something deeply broken inside of my heart. There's something broken inside of your hearts. And we will always be people in need of forgiveness. The question is, if we will be people willing to give forgiveness. We will always receive it from God. His promises are clear. His word is true. We will always receive it. The question for us today is, are we willing to give it? Are we willing to, instead of pointing the finger and say, I know what you did. I know what you did. I know what you said. I know what you, I know the story. Instead of doing that, are we willing to say, I know what you did and I'm willing to pay the price so that we can move past it. I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to accept the faithlessness of the past and be faithful to the future. Because that, oh friends, that's what we need. Not just as, as a church, but what each of us needs as individuals. I can't, I got four babies to hold. I don't have any arms to hold grudges. You have hands to hold. You have friends to hold. You have a community to hold up in your arms. We ain't got no room for grudges. Let them go. We don't have any room for hurt feelings. Let them go. Find it in your heart to forgive today. Now that might take the form of a conversation. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just a conversation that you need to have with the Lord to say, Lord, whew. Lord, you see my heart. You know how broken it is. Lord, I, I need you to help me find forgiveness because I can't find it in myself. Here's what I know is I know Ephesians chapter four, verse 32 says this, be kind to one another, tender hearted, hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. As God in Christ forgave you, not as you've already been forgiven or as you haven't been forgiven. It isn't, it isn't to play fair with revenge and unforgiveness. It is to, to be as Christ has been to forgive as he is forgiven. So this morning, the second part of our call is this. We're gonna take a, a couple minutes while our instrumentalists play and sing. And I'm gonna ask you to simply, right where you are, pray. Ask the Lord to help you to be Hosea, to help you to be the one who can forgive people who don't deserve it. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, We are people who are in need.